Welcome back to season five of Decision Points. I'm David Makovsky, the Ziegler Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. I'm happy to go on this journey with you. The past few weeks in the region has seen a set of actions that has at least the potential to have far-reaching consequences for the Mideast. Hezbollah, the crown jewel of Iran's proxy network, has suffered a devastating blow. Iran's air defenses have been dismantled, and at least a fragile ceasefire between Israel and Lebanon is holding. Moreover, the election of President Trump has introduced an entirely new level of unpredictability, sending shockwaves throughout the region. To help us navigate these complex developments, I'm honored to be joined by Professor Bernard Haeckel, one of the foremost authorities on Middle Eastern politics, religion, and society. As a scholar, historian, and someone who grew up during Lebanon's civil war, Haeckel brings a unique and deeply personal perspective to understanding the region's complexities from the inside. Among Americans, he has unsurpassed knowledge about the Saudi crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, known as MBS. Haeckel is coming out with a book about MBS shortly. Haeckel's expertise spans the full spectrum of Middle Eastern politics and society. Together, we'll dive into some of the most critical questions shaping the region today. How is the war changing perceptions within the Middle East, especially regarding the Israel-Lebanon ceasefire? How does the concept of Iran's ring of fire hold up in this new reality? What does Saudi Arabia's approach to normalization with Israel mean for its leadership and for Gaza's future? And how are these dynamics influenced by the advent of the new Trump administration? Professor Bernard Haeckel of Princeton University, welcome to Decision Points. It's a pleasure, David. I'm trying to understand the gravity of the moment. And looking primarily right now at the ceasefire in Lebanon and how it's playing out in the Arab world and in Iran and want to understand the implications. So before we get into a lot of the specifics, as someone who's a keen observer of this region, how big of a moment is this for the Middle East? It is a watershed moment, largely because the strategy that Iran had deployed and has deployed since the early 1980s, which is to develop and arm and indoctrinate non-state actors, proxies, Shiite proxies, the crown jewel was Hezbollah, that strategy seems to have failed spectacularly. After having succeeded for quite some time, you know, that proxy, Hezbollah, managed to ultimately get Israel to uh, leave Lebanon in 2000. That proxy was used in the Syrian civil war extremely effectively. Even before then, in the 2006 war against Israel, they seemed to do quite well, relatively speaking, compared to any other Arab army that had faced Israel before then. And then, of course, during the civil war, as I said, they helped prison Assad survive. His regime stayed in control of not all of Syria, but at least Damascus and significant part of Syria, including Aleppo, which has just been lost. But then, you know, it failed. And it failed in several ways. Firstly, rhetorically, it failed in that Hezbollah had claimed that, you know, they had 150,000 plus missiles that were guided, precision guided missiles, that they could do tremendous damage to Tel Aviv and to the Israeli military, and all that proved to be false. And I think for Arabs seeing this, they were reminded of what Saddam Hussein had said in the 1990s and before about destroying Israel, what President Nasser in the 50s and 60s had said about destroying Israel. Iran and its proxies have turned out to be a lot like other Arab and Muslim leaders who spoke very boastfully but vaingloriously and were unable to deliver on their promises. A lot of bravado that has like historical echoes and, you know, a real resonance of the past. But before I get into all the details, I want to add just on a personal note, you grew up in Lebanon during the Civil War, and you saw the country implode over that 14-year period between 75, 89. Contextualize this moment for Lebanon. Is it a time that is very reminiscent of the past? Is it one of just gloom and doom? Or is there some light at the end of the tunnel for Lebanon that is been going through a very tough period for a very long time. The defeat of Hezbollah, which is what we are seeing, is very reminiscent of earlier episodes when different Lebanese sects or factions opted to work as clients for outsiders. 
you know, the Christians for a while had Saudi Arabia and Israel as backers in, during the Civil War. And that failed spectacularly after 1982 when Bashir Ismail was assassinated. And ultimately, the Israelis abandoned the Christians, largely because the Christians didn't live up to the promises they had made to the Israelis. At the same time, the Sunnis were working with the PLO and with different other Arab and Muslim countries to back them in the civil war, and they were all abandoned and eventually lost as well. Now is the turn of the Shiites who turned to Iran, and the Iranians really turned a very a community, the Shiites who were dispossessed and discriminated against in Lebanese history, very backward community, and turned them into the most powerful community in Lebanese politics. And now they've been, as it were, also let down by their foreign sponsor. It seems like it's a bad film that keeps repeating itself for the Lebanese, where the lesson I think that should be drawn by all Lebanese factions is that if you turn to outsiders to help sort out your own problems, you're bound to fail and you're bound to alienate other Lebanese. And it's much better for the Lebanese to get along with each other and to focus on building a strong central state and to resolve their differences through that state rather than through an appeal to outsiders, which has been, you know, a repeated pattern, as I said, in, in Lebanese politics, Lebanese history. This seems something new, but public voices in Lebanon today going public and calling for Iran to stop exploiting the Palestinian cause to advance maybe a Persian or a Shia hegemony of sorts. These people don't seem intimidated as they've been until now. Now, these are very early days. We don't know how deeply rooted the ceasefire will be, but it seems like there's something going on in Lebanon that they see that there's a chance maybe to restore the sovereignty of the state and the calling for an outsiders to stay out. Does this seem new to you? Not really, unfortunately. Again, there are Lebanese who have always been critical of other Lebanese for working for outsiders. Basically, what you're seeing now with the criticism of Hezbollah and of Iran is the fear barrier having fallen. A lot of Lebanese who don't like Hezbollah, and there are many of them, don't fear Hezbollah's retaliation, which was the case before. I mean, Hezbollah was involved in the killing of many Lebanese dissidents or Lebanese who disagreed with Hezbollah, including a prime minister, Rafiq Hariri, but many journalists and intellectuals as well. And I suspect now that Hezbollah has been seen to have been weakened and to no longer be what it once was, people are not afraid of it, which is why you're seeing this kind of criticism. Now, if Hezbollah manages to get its act together and resort to violence against fellow Lebanese, you'll probably see a quieting down of these voices. Again, I don't think that this is something new. It's more a reflection of the changing power dynamics within Lebanese society. How do you think the Lebanese should best use this moment to ensure that an Iranian proxy, Hezbollah, albeit with roots in the Shia community, of course, in Lebanon, is there something the Lebanese can do themselves to ensure that Hezbollah is not able to uh, intimidate again? Because it seems like the people who fire the shots there call the shots. There are a lot of Lebanese who would like the institutions of state, beginning with the army, to reestablish its writ and its power over the entire territory. I'm not sure that the army can do this, largely because the army is also consists of different Lebanese sects who would be very reticent to go after one sect and not another. And the institutions of the state have to be reconsolidated and rebuilt. You also have a major economic problem in the country as well. You know, more than half the population is below the poverty line. And I don't see leadership in Lebanon, national leadership that's able to reconstitute either the army or the state. I hope I'm wrong. And I do think that Iran now is confronted with a choice between trying to rebuild the proxy powers that have been weakened and or go for a nuclear option, you know, race to a bomb. My bet is that the Iranians will not race to a bomb and will try to rebuild what they've lost because they have huge sunk costs in a movement like Hezbollah and they're not likely to abandon it just because it was weakened, you know, over the last few months. They will try to reconstitute it. I ask you about the Lebanese armed forces because this ceasefire seems all predicated on the idea that you could enhance the capacity of what's known as the LAF, the Lebanese armed forces. But capacity only seems to work if there's political will to confront Hezbollah. And if there's no will, it's unclear to me capacity will, will make a difference. 
It's about capacity. The world can help the LAF in this regard, but can it help it with will in confronting Hezbollah? If going after Hezbollah is interpreted as going after the Shiite community in the country, then you won't be able to succeed because you'll alienate most Shiites and they will side with Hezbollah against the Lebanese army and against the Lebanese state. So it has to be done in an incredibly sophisticated and intelligent and gentle way to keep most Shiites on side and to make a distinction between Hezbollah and the Shiites. And I'm not sure that can be pulled off. I mean, that's a feat of political acrobatics that is very difficult to do. You know, if you had the right leader, if you had a charismatic Lebanese leader or president who could navigate the sectarian minefield that is Lebanon, then maybe. But I, I don't see that person in the country. Is there a template, if you were to say, to do this, to thread this needle, it would require leadership like who? What would be your roadmap for this? There is in Lebanese history a leader, a former actually army general as well, called Fuad Sheb, who was president, who built the institutions of the state and was non-sectarian in his approach to running the country. But I don't see a Fuad Sheb character. Often in Lebanon, you get people who say, you know, we need a strong man. We need an MBS-like figure, you know, Mohammed bin Salman, crown prince of Saudi Arabia type figure in the country to kind of crack the whip and impose the law and fight corruption and put everyone in prison that's been feeding at the trough and destroying the institutions of the state. But I don't see such a figure in Lebanon, frankly. This is pretty sobering, what you're saying, which is that the U.S. is kind of bet the ceasefire on this mechanism of restoring state sovereignty for Lebanon, increasing the capacity of the LAF in the south below the Latani. And you're saying not so fast. It might not happen because anything against Hezbollah is going to be seen as anti-Shia. And a lot of the people in the LAF are Shia themselves. Correct. At least half the army is Shia. And they're not going to fight Hezbollah if Hezbollah is seen as representing the Shia. So I think it's still early days. We'll see. We'll see what also Iran plans to do. And I wouldn't be sanguine and optimistic about Lebanon, frankly. If you were to say like Hezbollah's road back to power, because I'm trying to understand how bad of a blow has Hezbollah suffered. Is it a function just of Iran giving it weapons or is it like, look, David, it's not so easy. Look at all these people. The economy's ruined. There's parts of the country are ruined. The, the salaries are not going to be there the way they were. You know, Hezbollah's going to have lost a lot of street cred with the Shia themselves. Look, Iran might be distracted with what's going on in Syria, for example, not being able to focus on Lebanon, given the fights between Assad and the rebels. Maybe the Iranians, they've got an eye towards a new Trump administration and feel cornered in a certain way, given what Israel has done, destroyed their air defenses. They're going to be going for a more diplomatic approach on the nuclear issue and don't count on Iran to suddenly just put the rewind button and, and just say, here, we're just going to ply you with all those weapons and you'll be back in business like you were before. Also, I mean, I think there's a crucial difference between the war in 2006, when a lot of destruction happened in Lebanon and the present situation. In 2006, you know, when the Shiites in Lebanon took the brunt of the Israeli attack, lots of the southern neighborhood Dahi of Beirut was destroyed, leveled, and a lot of villages and so on. After that war, the Qataris and various Arab countries, Kuwait and so on, I think even the Saudis, put a lot of money into the reconstruction of those areas. They're not there now. I don't think there's going to be Gulf money to rebuild the South, nor is there going to be a flood of money to pay the salaries of Hezbollah fighters. So Hezbollah and Iran, I think, are confronted with a situation where having to rebuild the cadres, especially the political cadres of Hezbollah, a lot of the institutions and leaders of the institutions have to be formed, you know, and that takes time and it takes money. And I'm not sure that they have the money or the time. And, and certainly if they want to rebuild their military capacity, that's going to take a very, very long time as well. So Hezbollah is confronted with a choice, you know, does it want to be a political party without a militia? Or if it wants to remain both a militia and a political party, then I think there's a very heavy lift here. Also, what's unknown is how the Shia themselves feel about Hezbollah. And my sources tell me that the community is split. Many Shia, half at least, feel that they paid a very high price 
for Iran to project its influence in the region and to act as a form of deterrence against an attack on Iran itself at the expense of the Shiite community in Lebanon. And the other half still is committed to Hezbollah and is pretending that this is a great victory and that there was no defeat. All of this is going to have to shake out in Lebanon amongst the Shia and in an environment in which violence is often resorted to, right? So let's say you're a prominent Shia who now hates Hezbollah and wants to see the end of the relationship with Iran. You know, Hezbollah could still take you out. You know, you're taking a risk if you do that. So we're going to see what's going to happen. And I don't think anyone really knows the answer to those questions. But what's different this time, if I'm listening to you correctly, is don't assume that all the Shia are in the pocket of Hezbollah. The way they used to see them as their advocate. They've also seen them as a liability, not just as an asset, in terms of all the dislocation, the economic catastrophe, the military devastation. But And in your view, that is like a prerequisite that the Shia are not reflexively pro-Hezbollah. That at least gives you a chance. Am I right? Yes, I agree. I don't think that the Shia are all reflexively pro-Hezbollah at this moment. Also, Hezbollah has lost something very precious which is that it had the benefit of people believing in its political rhetoric and in its promises to defend Lebanon and to inflict a very heavy blow on Israel should Israel ever decide to engage in an all-out attack on Lebanon. And that has proven to be false. Once you lose that aura of invincibility or at least parity with Israel, you know, you've lost the trust of people and the confidence that you can defend them. And that's not something that can be easily rebuilt and brought back. I remember a conversation I had with Fuad Ajami, this great analyst of the Arab world. We used to teach together at Johns Hopkins Graduate School called SICE, and we were talking after the 2006 war, and he said, David, just know that when you give money to people, in, and he's from this village, Arnun, in southern Lebanon, he said, when you give money to people to rebuild their house, they will trust you once, but if this happens again, it's very different. Yeah, and it's happened also again in very different circumstances where Lebanon is on its knees economically and where the money to rebuild these destroyed homes and infrastructure is not there. In terms of what is Iran lost, I mean, its whole ring of fire of all these proxies that will basically wear Israel down by surrounding it, saying we're not going to count on the states in the Arab world, but we're going to count on these proxies within the states, chief among them Hezbollah, but there's proxies in these other countries. I'm trying to understand the extent of the blow to their proxy network. Are they on the ropes? Is this fatal for them? Or can Iran restore its proxy network? What will it take? And I think, you know, as I listen to you also, like it just seems that for Iran to restore deterrence, it's either rebuild the proxy network, accelerate the nuclear program. Those seem to be two of the leading options. So let's just look at the proxy option. How much has Iran lost and how serious is it, you know, if they want to restore what they have? Is that possible? You know, if they choose to restore Hezbollah, it's going to take many years, not least just the weapons that were destroyed, but also, again, the training, the cadres, the officers. I mean, those attacks that Israel waged on Hezbollah, especially the pager attack, you know, knocked out. And then also, of course, the direct attacks on the top leadership. You're talking about tier one, tier two leaders, you know, in this movement. These are people who were formed and trained over decades, you know, if you took out one or you took out two or you took out 10, yeah, they're fungible. You could replace them. But when you take out hundreds or thousands, I mean, it's a very different scenario. And I don't think they can be reconstructed easily. And that's why I've been told that a lot of the officers who were waging the battles and leading the battles in the last few weeks of this war before the ceasefire were Iranian. They were not Lebanese. I mean, the fighters were Lebanese, but the officers were not. And that tells me that, you know, if it's true, which I suspect it is, that tells me that the leadership of Hezbollah has been decimated. And the present leader of Hezbollah, the secretary general, you know, is a very marginal figure and someone without any of the charisma and any of the capacities that were there before. 
he wasn't a security guy at all, right? I mean, he dealt with domestic, local issues that are economic and things like that. I mean, he was not a charismatic security figure. We're not talking Qasem Soleimani or Hassan Nasrallah at all. Correct. And I think, you know, one piece of evidence for the weakness of Iran and its proxy network is the incredible kind of victory that we're seeing in Syria now by different Syrian opposition factions, including, you know, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, this HDS movement that is a Islamist movement. You don't have Hezbollah fighters, you don't have Iranian Revolutionary Guards in Aleppo to defend it. And so we're seeing the effects of the war in Lebanon in Syria now. It's one of the reasons for the victories that we've seen for the opposition. It's clear that they waited until the ceasefire and say, okay, you know, Iran is distracted, Russia's distracted, and Hezbollah is isolated, and they were fighting us in Syria. This is the time to restore the offensive against Hafez al-Assad. Yeah, exactly. But your view is that Iran has a lot of sunken costs in its proxy network. If they don't accelerate the nuclear program, you do think that it might be a very uphill battle and Hezbollah's leadership is decimated, but you think Iran will invariably revert back to that strategy to try to restore that network, believing it's their best card to play. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. You also have to remember that Iran, despite the blows that it has received, both against Hezbollah, the militias in Iraq and Syria, including also the Houthis in Yemen and Hamas in Gaza, you have to remember that Iran still has a formidable arsenal in the Persian Gulf. They could still easily disrupt oil shipments, maritime trade in the Persian Gulf, and also in the Arabian Sea with the Houthis in Yemen. So, you know, yes, they're on their back foot, but as of now, we don't see like a complete knockout of the Iranians. They're down, but not out, so to speak. Correct. You know, you look at what happened on October 26th when Israel knocked out Iran's air defense network. It seems like the S-300 didn't lay a finger on 140 Israeli planes that wreaked damage by flying of not in Iranian airspace, in Iraqi airspace. You know, when you don't have air defenses, when you don't have ballistic missile manufacturing, I'm trying to pursue how weak is Iran. I take your point that they're down and not out. You mentioned references to Nasser and Saddam, who famously called for Israel's destruction, and they themselves were the ones who suffered defeat. I'm just wondering, is this a brittle regime? I think for Israel, there's a trauma of, of 1982 in Lebanon, where it's very hard to socially engineer an Arab country when you're a Jewish state. Israel has pretty much disavowed that since that 82 experience with Bashar Jamal on uh, the Christian community. Or do you think that, look, this is a unique moment in time, David, it'll never get better than this, given Iran having no air defenses, Hezbollah, the famous second strike threat perched on Israel's border, they are a shadow of what they were. Do you think the idea of regime change from the outside is something that should not be totally discounted and dismissed because we're at this very unique moment. So I'm told by different people that I've spoken to that Israel has decided that a state policy, one of the strategic goals today is to actually go after the Iranian regime and perhaps even to engage in regime change. So is Prime Minister Netanyahu going to decide to do that? How would he do that? What would it take to accomplish that? And what would you have, you know, in place of this regime? So I think the Israelis are probably going to go after the Iranians again. Certainly the rulers in the Gulf, in the UAE and in Saudi Arabia are worried about this. And they think that this is a golden opportunity. Israel will do it. They don't necessarily think Israel should do it. They think Israel will do it, not least because they're going to get American support for it. And in any case, they have the capacity to do it regardless of the Americans. That's the Gulf view. My sense of the Iranians is that they center foreign minister around the region before the last Israeli attack. I believe their foreign minister was in Riyadh around October 7th. And what was interesting about this Iranian visit was that essentially the Iranians said that if the Israelis attack our oil facilities, our oil installations, we're going to attack your oil facilities in the Gulf, right? So in other words, if the regime is existentially threatened, we're going to sow mayhem and wreak havoc in the Gulf 
by attacking Saudi Arabia and UAE and so on. And that's something that really scares the Gulf countries, not just because, you know, knocking out their oil installations would set them back and it would take months to rebuild their capacity. It would also cause mayhem in the global economy. But more dangerously for the Gulf is that if the Iranians decide to go after the desalination plants, the plants that desalinate salt water and produce fresh water for their populations, that could really be extremely devastating. Yeah, for them. So the Gulf regimes, whether Saudi, UAE, Kuwait, don't want an all-out war with Iran because the Iranians are capable of doing this if they're existentially threatened. I always worry about the question of regime change, not only because you don't know what can happen if that takes place. It could be very messy. Iran is a very big country with lots of people. You get something much, much worse without this regime. My view would be to go back to that question that Henry Kissinger posed, which is Iran has to decide whether it's a nation or a cause. And I think if you can get the Iranian leadership to stop being a cause and become an act more like a nation through containment, through sanctions, through the threat of violence and war, that would be a better option than trying to topple the regime itself. You're the rare person who actually did your dissertation at Oxford on Salafism in early Yemen. And I think it's not understood why the Houthis today in Yemen are so dedicated to firing on Israel. They're so far away. Yes, you could say so is Iran. They're also far away. There's no shared border. There's nothing disputed, nothing contiguous to fight over. But I think on their flag, it's kill America, kill Jews. Why are the Houthis so dedicated? And what could be done in this regard? To state the obvious, they've also been very disruptive when it comes to free shipping, that traffic has to go around the Suez Canal in a way that was thought unthinkable, how this Yemeni rebel group has wreaked so much havoc in the Middle East. So Yemen is a very complicated country, and I don't want to get into the weeds or inside baseball with your audience and lose them. So let me try to explain it as simply as possible. So the Houthis, this rebel movement in Yemen, represents a particular group in society. They are people who claim descent from the Prophet Muhammad. So they're called Sayyids in Yemen, which means masters in Arabic. And they're about 5 to 7% of the population. This is a movement that's led by these people, and they have a particular ideology which represents a break with the past, with their own religious past. And this group wants to stay in power, right? So very often when you look at Middle Eastern politics, you have to think about who is it that is seeking power? What's their social base? Who do they represent in society? And how are they trying to get power and then keep it and hold on to it? So this particular group wants to stay in power in Yemen, and they're a minority in their own society. One of the ways in which they acquire legitimacy is to engage in an ideology against America, an anti-imperialism, against Israel, but also against Jews. On their banner, one of the things they repeat is a curse to all Jews. It's on their flag, right? Yeah. So they're like an out-and-out anti-Semitic movement. It's not just anti-Israel. And I think they do all of this largely because their own power base, their own kind of legitimacy, given that they're a minority, is at risk. And, you know, the fact that they can stop shipping, especially American ships, Israeli ships, and so on, the fact that they can claim that they're doing damage to Israel and so on, is a huge source of support among Yemeni people. And they will not stop from doing what they're doing unless they're forced to do it. And it's not just, by the way, an anti-Americanism and anti-Israeli. They're also very anti-Saudi. They're constantly attacking Saudi Arabia and its leadership as well. And all of which, you know, has resonance inside Yemen and gives them additional popular support. I don't mean to flatter or anything like that, but I think from what I hear, you were the one American closest to Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who's a key figure. The future of Saudi Arabia seems focused on him, obviously a very controversial person, given developments of the past. We know he has put out an economic and social modernization vision for Saudi Arabia at the center of his leadership called Vision 2030. 
Maybe on a personal note, how have you come to get to know the Crown Prince, MBS as he's known, by his acronym? And how does normalization with Israel fit into his economic and social modernization visions? Because some wonder, look, it's all very instrumentalist. He wants to get a U.S.-Saudi defense treaty. For that, he needs two-thirds of the Senate. That hasn't happened since Japan in 1960. He thinks an Israeli deal will help him get his main thing, which is a defense treaty, because he's not part of NATO, and he fears that Iran hits Saudi Arabia like they did it with Aramco in 2019. There's no one there to help him. He's all alone. You know the guy. Help us understand your relationship with him, who he is, and how normalization with Israel fits into his wider vision of modernization. Let me just preface my remarks by saying that I don't think I'm the closest uh, American to him, but I'm certainly the American who's met with him the most in terms of ours and who speaks to him in Arabic. And so therefore, I probably know him better than most Americans. I'm not his friend, nor am I his advisor, either officially or unofficially. So I have no contractual or any formal relationship with the guy. The way I met him was through one of his advisors, who was an old friend of mine. He's someone who rose through the ranks in the Saudi bureaucracy and ended up after 2015 as being one of his advisors on domestic issues. And this advisor asked me whether I'd want to meet with him. He was then deputy crown prince. You know, I've been going to Saudi Arabia since 1998, and I know lots of people in Saudi Arabia, both dissidents as well as members of the royal family bureaucrats, journalists, artists, and so on. And so I said, of course, I jumped at the opportunity to meet with him because, you know, he's an interesting figure and my business is to know as much as possible at the kingdom. So it was an opportunity. So I met with him in early 2016. We sat for several hours, you know, from three to six in the morning, I think, and chatted in Arabic. And he realized that I'm this guy who knows a lot about his country. And I don't think he meets a lot of Americans who are like that and who can speak in Arabic and so on. And we then continued on meeting at his request and then eventually exchanged phone numbers and have this WhatsApp connection as well. Yeah, we hear you you guys text together. Yeah. I mean, he texts with lots of people, by the way, also lots of Americans. But, you know, I probably text with him on a whole range of issues that most people don't. I, you know, was very curious about him and he was willing to meet with me. And so we've done this repeatedly since 2016, you know, until last month, in fact. And I'm writing a book on the kingdom and on him and how he fits into the history of the kingdom. That's why I'm keen to get to know him. The thing about him that's different from other Saudi princes that I've met, there are several things that are different about him. Firstly, he's a very committed nationalist, and he is extremely worried about the future survival of the regime, given the energy transition and the very heavy dependence on oil that the state has. And this is a redistributive state that basically redistributes the money of the oil to the population, doesn't tax this population. And so he wants to find a new formula for regime survival. To do that, he has to diversify the economy, become less dependent on oil, and build up new sectors and also eventually allow for taxation as a source of revenue for the state. That's his thing. And he will do anything to promote Saudi Arabia, to promote its stability, its diversification, and its strengthening. He also feels that the old priorities of the state and of its leaders were misplaced. So, for instance, Lebanon is a good example of this. He feels that Saudi Arabia spent billions on trying to build Lebanon and got nothing for it other than corruption and its money being stolen by the Lebanese. And essentially, it was wasted, a wasted effort and wasted resources. So you don't see him going back to that? Because, I mean, people have talked about this issue, will the Gulf invest in a Lebanese economy? And it sounds like you have your doubts. Yeah, I have my doubts about Lebanon. I think he looks around him and he thinks, frankly, Sudan is much more important than Lebanon as a strategic security threat to his country. Yemen, of course, is much more important. Jordan. So I think he has a different set of priorities for his own country and what's important, what's not. He's not a sentimental person, doesn't have any illusions, is a politician's politician as well. He's extremely charming if he wants to be, and is full of ideas and ambition for his country. That's essentially, you know, kind of a summary of the person. The other thing that makes him also different from others is that he was never, given his age and given where he is in the royal family, he had no hope of ever reaching to becoming crowned prince and eventually king. 
he deployed incredible skill, political skill, maneuvering within the royal court, within the royal family, in this very competitive environment to reach to the position that he got to. And that required kind of a Machiavellian ruthlessness, a kind of instinctive intelligence about the country's politics and its hierarchies. In that respect, he's kind of a master at navigating Saudi society and navigating the royal family and the bureaucracy and so on, and is willing to use all kinds of means to get what he wants, including being ruthless if necessary. So where does Israel fit into this? How does Israel help him? Is it part of a modernization context of sorts? So he's a very pragmatic guy, and he looks at Israel and he sees a successful economy and a successful, tough society with a very powerful military and a very good, close connection to the West and particularly to the United States. So there's a lot of admiration for the power and success, and he wants to replicate some of that in his own country. There are no sentiments in the way he analyzes things. He also realizes that Israel is not only a model of economic and technological prowess and military prowess, it's also a way into the West and into America because Israel has all these connections and this influence. And he wants to be able to use it for the sake of his own national interests. So I do think he does want these deals with the Americans. He wants a mutual defense treaty. He wants an AI treaty on artificial intelligence. He wants a free trade agreement with the United States. He also wants a nuclear agreement with the United States. And he knows that he can't get any of those things without not only having an excellent relationship with the United States, but also potentially getting it through a normalization agreement with Israel. First of all, the Americans will want that, and the Israelis will work to help the Saudis get it. This gets us to the question, the $64,000 question, and you, I think, are positioned better than anyone to answer this, which is, can this mega deal, a three-way deal between the U.S. and the Saudis and Israel come about? Is there a formula out there that squares the circle? Because what we hear is that MBS personally cares very little for the Palestinians, and there are anecdotes to this effect. But at the same time, after October the 7th, he cannot be accused of ignoring the quest for Palestinian statehood, or else he imperils his leadership in the Arab and Muslim world. Now, you could say maybe both are true. Maybe he's got his own personal preferences, but as a leader, he feels that there's certain thresholds he has to cross here. And you know this is an Israeli government that doesn't want to hear about two states, you know, whether you like the prime minister, you don't like the prime minister, but because a lot of the public feels, well, you know, it's if the state was Costa Rica, of course I would be for it, but it could be a mini Iran like Iran was, you know, Hamas outmuscled the PA in Gaza in 2007 and never recovered. And therefore withdrawal makes you more vulnerable, not more secure. Some say, look, only a Saudi deal will stop the slide to annexation. And I could tell you, as someone who follows domestic dynamics in Israel, I think that could be the case in 2025. But I just wonder, do you see this as something very much on the table? There's the Reuters story the other day saying Saudi Arabia's had second thoughts about the treaty and the normalization. And we don't know if that is because how they read the Israeli government or it's because they want to tell Trump we're not in your pocket but it's more of an opening negotiating position. So if you had to bet in 2025, how likely is such a diplomatic breakthrough between Saudi Arabia and Israel? How possible is it in your mind? I think it is possible because the Saudis want it, the Israelis want it. The question is whether they can agree to what the terms will be. I think the Saudis and MBS in particular, it's true. I don't think he has much respect for the Palestinian leadership of the PA, and generally of Palestinian leaders going back generations, because he feels that they didn't serve the Palestinian people. They were often corrupt and unwilling to make any sacrifices, you know, for the sake of their own people. And he doesn't respect them for that. I also think that MBS, however, has come to the realization that the Palestinian issue is not just important for itself like for what it means for the Palestinians. It's important because as long as it's not resolved in some way, what that way is, is open to negotiation. But as long as it's not resolved, spoilers like Iran and others, Al-Qaeda, whatever, you know, extremist Islamists, including Islamists domestically and so on, will always be able to use it 
to prevent the region from becoming stable and developing economically. If you didn't have the Palestinian issue, you wouldn't have the Houthis being able to use it to foment trouble in Yemen and on the Saudi border. I think he deeply believes that something has to happen in order to stop the spoilers. There are Israelis who feel the same way, by the way. And he's hoping that, you know, those people, when the dust settles and people's nerves have calmed a bit more and Israelis are less traumatized, will come to that conclusion as well and that realization as well. What form a Palestinian state will take is not as important as just settling this issue once and for all. Do you think it would be enough to find some sort of rhetorical formula, like there needs to be a credible pathway, like a negotiation towards statehood, or he's looking for something beyond that? But even think that the credible pathway for Netanyahu might break apart his government, but I'm just looking to see if there's different options, gradations, to see if this could still happen on the watch of this government in Israel. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how carefully thought through it is for the Saudis. I think what they want is for the United States and all countries to recognize something called a Palestinian state so that at least in terms of international law, it actually exists. Then filling it out with content is something that will be up for negotiation. I don't think they expect the Israelis to agree to any of this quickly or soon. But I think what they want of the Israelis is to come to the realization that as long as you haven't solved this issue, you're not serving your own interests. Like your own interests of having Iran and other spoilers out of the picture requires you to do something for the Palestinians. It's not an act of generosity. It's actually an act of self-preservation. I really want to look to 2025 and look at how do the Saudis see the advent of the Trump administration, what it means for them in the region. The issue of Gaza stabilization could be part of this. We hear the Saudis are not in the same reform camp, perhaps, of the Emiratis who want a more of an empowered prime minister of the PA and are willing to provide economic support if the shifts in the PA happen. The Saudis have had a, a more mixed relationship with the PA because of what you said, that they've had questions about corruption and the like. I'm just trying to think about this look at how Saudi sees its relations with the United States and how that translates itself to a role that it's willing to play in Gaza and the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. I think that the Biden administration did a massive about turn, a 180 degree turn, you know, when it came to Saudi Arabia. He came in saying they were a pariah state, and now he's emerged saying as he would love to do the Abraham Accords 2.0. Exactly right. And he also released the CIA document that blamed MBS for the murder of Khashoggi, and he removed the Houthis from the list of terrorism and so on. So Biden came in, you know, as a real enemy and opponent of MBS, in particular in Saudi Arabia, more generally. And all of that changed, right? With the Ukrainian war, it started before that. Now they were extremely close to negotiating all these agreements. And I gather that most of the agreements are actually pretty much there to be penned between the U.S. and Saudi. And also you had Senator Lindsey Graham, who was constantly going to Saudi Arabia and telling the Saudis that you're better off with the Democrats than with the Republicans because the Democrats could deliver the 67 votes in the Senate, whereas the Republicans couldn't. So that was constantly being said to them. So I think they would have been perfectly happy with a Democratic administration that kept on the same path and line of thinking as the Biden administration now is. Now, with Trump, they have very good relations. They have very good relations with his son-in-law. They have extremely close relations with a number of the key people in the Trump administration. But they also worry about Trump, like I think many people do, which is that he's more transactional. In September 2019, when the Iranians hit their oil facilities, he didn't respond. But, you know, they're not unhappy about him being there. And they haven't said this to me, but I think that one thing they're really hoping for from President Trump is that he wants the Nobel Prize for peace and that that will mean that he will put pressure on Israel to agree to some sort of formula for the Palestinians. And that if that happens, Trump gets the Nobel, Palestinians get some form of state and the Saudis can normalize the Israelis. You know, everyone gets what they want. Their focus really is on trying to develop their domestic economy and to transform their country. And anything and everything that will serve that purpose is something that they will support. So if that means helping the Palestinians rebuild Gaza, they will do it. If there's a kind of interest in stabilizing the Palestinians, they will get involved in that effort. They're not against it.
our listeners are going to want to know, many were taken aback at a recent Arab League meeting. The Crown Prince talked about genocide in Gaza and talked about Israeli invasion of Iranian airspace and the like. It seems like maybe this is an optimistic gloss on it, but here's a case. Look, they don't have a defense treaty yet with the United States. And when the Iranian foreign minister is going around and saying, uh, hey, um, you know, uh, if you cooperate with Israel, we're going to hit you, that could be intimidating. But that doesn't mean that if there was a defense treaty and they had the normalization with Israel, that he would sound the way he's sounding in the last month or so. So there were two explanations for why MBS used the term genocide and condemned the attacks on Lebanon and Iran. One explanation is that there was a lot of pressure from within Saudi society and the Arab world more broadly to condemn Israel for the civilian deaths in Palestinian territories. It's possible as one reason, although I think the more likely reason, in my opinion, is that the threat from Iran is very real. The threat from Iran on Saudi oil and other infrastructure like desalination and so on is quite real. And I think MBS is quite keen to signal to the Iranians and to underscore the neutrality of Saudi Arabia, that Saudi Arabia will not help the Israelis or the Americans in any regime change, all out war effort against Iran. Because frankly, the Iranians can do tremendous damage to him. He doesn't want that given, you know, what He's already experienced with the Houthis with thousands of rockets and missiles and drones from the Houthis. That's my explanation of the situation. And there's no downside to this, you know, given that there's an unlikely treaty to be signed anytime soon. So if you were to say, though, as we sum up, Trump, the Nobel Prize and a Saudi mega deal, that is something that has a lot of appeal to MBS. Am I right to say he also feels a certain affinity with Jared Kushner, who, you know, is invested in his funds for sure, but that they have some sort of a relationship that whether Kushner joins the government or does not join the government, that if there's going to be an Abraham Accords 2.0 and this is going to be the Super Bowl of all peace treaties, this is something that he very much wants. If you can get the 67 votes, which might be harder, as Lindsey Graham suggests, without a Democratic president. Yeah, I think that what MBS wants is a victory and a win for Saudi Arabia. So, you know, whatever he does, it has to be framed that he has accomplished something for Saudi Arabia that no other king before him has ever been able to accomplish because the Saudis have never had a treaty with the United States or any of the other things that he wants, you know, AI and nuclear and so on. That's the way he's going to frame it. I don't think it's about friendship or about relations with Jared or anyone else. You know, all politics is local and he cares deeply about how he's seen by Saudis and he wants a win for them. And that is how he's going to frame and explain any deal that he does, whether with the United States or with Israel. I want to thank you so much for this very wide ranging conversation, dealing with the here and now of the Lebanon ceasefire and what it means for the region and for your thoughts and insights on a range of topics relating to Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia. You've truly enriched us in understanding a lot of these dynamics that are so obscure to many around the world. And this was very helpful. I just want to thank you so much, Professor Bernard Haeckel, a Middle East scholar at Princeton University. Thank you so much for joining us today on Decision Points. Thank you, David. It's an honor. Today, we explored some of the most critical dynamics shaping the Middle East in the wake of the recent war. Hezbollah's leadership has been decimated. Its elite operatives, formed and trained over decades, eliminated, and rebuilding will take years, even with Iran's support. Iran, meanwhile, finds itself at a critical juncture. Its proxy network has suffered severe blows, from Syria to Lebanon, compounded by the loss of air defense systems and ballistic missile capabilities following Israel's October 26 strikes. While Iran retains disruptive potential in the Persian Gulf and across the Middle East, it is undeniably on its back foot. Today, Iran faces a fundamental decision, rebuild its proxies or shift its focus and even accelerate towards a nuclear bomb. 
or just maybe, facing all these blows and more economic pressure ahead from the U.S., does it take a step back and become less destabilizing? We might recall former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger's question, will Iran decide to be a nation instead of a cause? Turning to Saudi Arabia, we examined Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's vision for the future. A committed nationalist, MBS is acutely aware of the risk tied to Saudi dependence on oil and is maneuvering to diversify its economy under its Vision 2030. At the same time, he faces growing pressures to address the Palestinian issue, at least in some form, in a potential mega deal with Israel and the United States. As we look ahead to the return of a Trump administration, Saudi leaders express a mix of cautious optimism and concern. They see Trump as a transactional figure, but hope his desire for a legacy-defining achievement, such as a Nobel Prize for Peace, could push him to a mega deal. This means a U.S.-Saudi defense treaty, a Saudi-Israeli normalization deal, but it would involve some pressure on the current coalition in Jerusalem to at least take some declarative steps down the road towards a two-state solution. The Saudis' involvement in stabilizing the Palestinian issue will likely depend on the alignment of their national interests with a broader peace plan. Thus, the Middle East stands at a crossroads, with powerful actors reevaluating their strategies and priorities. The choices made in the coming months by Washington, Jerusalem, Riyadh, and Tehran will shape the region's future. I want to thank my listeners all over the world for listening to another episode of Decision Points. Thank you to my dedicated team of research assistants at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. I want to thank Rena Gabber, Simone Seidmeier, Sidney Hillbush, and Gabriel Epstein. I also want to thank Rob, Hadia, and the production team at Podville Media, and listeners like yourselves for making this podcast possible. Please leave us a five-star review so we can continue to grow this community. Subscribe to Decision Points on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Acast, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're on WhatsApp, X, or a variety of social media platforms, I invite you to share this show with your friends. To our listeners from all over the world, thank you for listening to this season of Decision Points.